Welcome everyone, I'm Diana Marsh. I'm an assistant professor of archives and digital curation here at the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies or iSchool. And I wanna welcome you all on behalf of the iSchool as well as our still fairly new center, uh, the Center for Archival Futures, which is made up of researchers and professionals and students that explore human-centered approaches to using and caring for archives and digital collections and data over time. And this is part of a host of First Wednesdays and other talks that have been sponsored by CAFE this year. And you can see those at cafe.ischool.umd.edu slash events. So I'll put that in the chat as soon as I'm done speaking. Um, today, many of us are beaming in from College Park, which is located on the ancestral territories of the Piscataway, Nakashtank, and their indigenous kid and neighbors. And at the University of Maryland as a land grant university, before I say anything else, I wanna acknowledge the 202,000 acres of indigenous land taken and distributed to the university under the Morrill Act in 1862. And I wanna acknowledge the separation that these and many other acts of colonialism and assimilation, which included archival collecting, generated between indigenous peoples and their homelands. And I wanna further acknowledge the continued power and resilience of indigenous communities and nations and celebrate the collaborative and decolonizing work now taking place in our collections and institutions, and of course, in our research. Today, I wanna to welcome Doug Ward as our speaker. Doug is a professor here at the iSchool with a joint appointment at the University of Maryland Institute for Advanced Computer Studies. Doug's research centers around the use of emerging technologies to support information seeking, e-discovery, and cross-language information retrieval, for which he's well known. He earned a PhD in electrical engineering here at the University of Maryland College Park and a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Rice University. Doug's talk today is entitled Speaking with the Past, Novel Forms of Access to Spoken Word Collections. And Doug, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks, Diana. Well, so what I want to do today is illustrate a piece of the other side of CAFE. CAFE has everything from soup to nuts, and I will leave it to you to decide whether this is soup or nuts when we get to the end. Uh, what I want to talk about today is some work that I have been doing since about the turn of the century um, in which we're trying to ask the question, and this is team effort. You can see some of the names of folks that I've worked with on it here on the slide. Uh, we're trying to ask the question, how should we interact with our cultural heritage when our cultural heritage is not written, it's not physical objects, it's spoken, right? And so the question is, what do we do with spoken word collections? How can we interact with them? How should we think about interacting with them? And I'd like to start a conversation more broadly about that uh, using this talk. So let me just start out by naming some spoken word collections, if I can get my screen to do its thing. OK. Um, so I started by working with the Shoah Foundation. I mean, if the question is, what the heck is an electrical engineer doing doing this? Um, the answer is that a group of us electrical engineers got recruited to work with an unprecedented collection of materials that the Shoah Foundation had put together, 55,000 different interviews, uh, all of people who had experienced a single event, which was the Holocaust, um, and so just imagine you've got 55,000 perspectives on one event. How do you tell that story? And uh, our idea was um, by pulling out the technology toy store and just doing everything we could with it. So we had uh, speech recognition. All the content had been digitized already by the Shoah Foundation. But we had speech recognition. We had named entity detection. We had uh, relationship detection. Um, we had all kinds of, uh, uh, of tasks for doing uh, retrieval, information retrieval. We had evaluation collections we put together. Um, and so this was some work sponsored by the National Science Foundation um, in the early 2000s. Um, started in 2001, ran for seven years, um, and uh, developed some new technology for dealing with collections that were in multiple languages, not just English. Um, uh, there are 32 different languages. We worked on seven of them. Um, and uh, people uh, often speaking with accents, 
Uh, many people, of course, uh, were displaced as a result of the Holocaust and so speak with an accent that is native to a region different from the region they're living in now, different from the language that they're speaking now. Uh, and so these were interesting technical challenges, but they also led to questions about what should access look like. Um, we weren't the only people working with oral history collections. There's a larger collection of oral history in the British Library. Uh, there's now a larger collection of interviews, um, which people think of not as oral history, but as community memory, sort of some broader concept of collecting um, uh, interviews. Uh, uh, from a service called StoryCorps, which if you listen to National Public Radio, you can hear uh, stories from StoryCorps. Um, but there is other kinds of historical audio as well. You can see here, I've listed uh, some of those. Uh, but then we're just drowning in audio these days. I mean, there are 48 million podcast episodes as of a year ago. Um, so uh, we're not gonna run out of audio uh, to try to, um, uh, to try to find. And if we do, um, well, my gosh, just about every one of us has in our pocket an audio recording device, and we can just make more of it. Um, and so um, uh, thinking about how we're going to deal with uh, all of this audio in a way that makes sense uh, is a worthwhile thing to do. Now, I want to tell a story from the people who study us. So we study things, but there are people who study us. Uh, and the people who study us have recognized a pattern in the way that we work, which is that we design things by analogy. So I have here um, a, um, a picture of a horseless carriage. And doesn't it look for all the world like a carriage? Um, and there's no horse, uh, but otherwise it looks pretty much like a carriage. Um, and of course, this has evolved to what's parked in your driveway now over time, but we didn't know how to design what's parked in your driveway now. What we knew how to design was a carriage, so we did. Um, this other thing, this is Edison's electric light. Um, and you can see it, it doesn't really look like a light. I mean, for, for one thing, it's got a wick, right? Because if you, if you have something that makes light at night, uh, that's a candle. And so if you need a way of thinking about it, well, then you, you put a wick on it so that people can it. So the wick is completely unnecessary for the, um, uh, for the operation of the electric light, uh, but it's necessary for people to be able to think about what an electric light is because we didn't have other ways of thinking about electric lights. In fact, the wick is actually a problem. Um, they had to put signs in the rooms that had these electric lights that said this room is equipped with an electric light, do not attempt to light with a match. Uh, turn the key on the wall by the door. Now, why the key? Well, because if I told you to turn the switch on the wall by the door, you've never seen a switch before, right? I mean, think of it, it's a light switch and you've never seen a light before. Um, and so, but you've seen a key, you can turn keys and when you turn keys, something could happen. And so you could imagine turning on the light with a key, right? That's a little bit like the way you would run a kerosene lamp or something like that. Um, and then of course, there's, there's the obligatory uh, 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 explanation that uh, this is not dangerous and it won't affect your sleep, which turns out not to be true actually from later studies, it does affect your sleep if you leave the lights on. Okay, in any case, um, this is the way we design systems to find speech. We design them exactly the same way we've designed things before. Um, in fact, when the oral history profession started, um, they didn't think that the goal was to get a tape recording. They thought the goal was to get a typed document. Um, and so uh, when people would make an oral history, they would have a conversation and that was sort of the first draft and then they would transcribe it. Um, and then after they transcribed it, they would reuse the tape because tape was awfully expensive. Uh, and the tape wasn't the product, the tape was just an enabling technology. And so they keep a little slice of tape so that you could, you could hear what someone's voice sounded like, but there was no idea that you might wanna actually hear the original voice because the way you communicated information was in writing. Um, and of course we think differently now, but that's how they were thinking. And, and so then people would, would edit the transcript 
And then the edited transcript would be produced and that would be what became public. And in fact, you could get people to speak candidly because you could promise them the ability to edit. Now, of course, not everybody had time to edit uh, after the interview, uh, but nonetheless, this was the process. And so this was patterned on writing. So this is speech as writing, right? A spoken word collection with you, that you can't hear, right? It only produces writing. Uh, of course, by the time the Shoah Foundation came along, they thought about it completely differently. Uh, they didn't think even making a transcript was an ethical act. Um, they thought that, that the, the speech was the thing that was spoken, uh, and that was the memory uh, that they wanted to preserve. So, so perspectives shift over time. Now, the same thing is true in our building of uh, technology for searching these. So this is from the oldest oral history program in the world, which is a Columbia University. Um, and we're searching here um, for things on aviation. And they collected on diplomatic history. So they have, for example, Hap Arnold, who was the, uh, the head of the Army Air Corps in World War II. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, the Air Force Academy, and well, the Marines had airplanes too, and and the Navy had airplanes, and and so you can see this is this is sort of speech retrieval as Google, right? Um, in fact, it's it's it's, it's more a speech retrieval as online library catalog. Um, it's sort of not with all of the the appurtenances that Google has around these things. It's it's what you might call ten blue links. Um, and, and this is the way we think about searching oral history collections today. Uh, I went on sabbatical to the National Library of Australia, uh, and the National Library of Australia has very nice uh, search technology that looks exactly like this. Um, it's, it's actually in their online library catalog system, as you would expect, um, because it, the oral history is held by, by the library. Okay, so this is the way we think. And, and the question is, is this the right way? And the answer is, of course, yes, because we don't know any other way. This is how we think about search. But while I was working on this project with the Shoah Foundation, I met a number of Holocaust survivors. The Shoah Foundation was at the time, it's not anymore, but it was at the time on the back lot of Universal Studios. And we were sending students out in January from Maryland to the back lot of Universal Studios where they were, you know, going through requests that had come in to the Shoah Foundation and building collections for, for what kinds of questions do people ask and doing analysis of that sort of thing. And they thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, and we sent them out there before the professors, which was completely backwards. Uh, but eventually I got out there. Uh, and of course, they, 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 they were indexing all of these um, Holocaust survivor uh, interviews and they had Holocaust survivors who lived in the Los Angeles area who came by and we got to meet with them. Um, and we got to talk with them about, you know, what they expected to have come out of our project where, you know, we were working on technology, but the Shoah Foundation was sort of our front to them, and the Shoah Foundation was working on memory. Um, and so um, over the course of the conversation, I remember one question that really just changed the way I thought about this. I said, well, you know, uh, you, you go around and give talks, and, and this is a human contact. What's going to happen after you're gone? And the best answer anybody could give me was, well, my kids will go around and give talks. And, and I let the conversation drop there, but what'll happen when they're gone? Um, is this just gonna be a TV show? I mean, I know how people think about stuff they see on TV, right? I turn the TV on while I'm making dinner. Uh, that's not the same thing. That's not what we're trying to accomplish, right? Uh, what we're trying to accomplish is this, right? Um, and so the question is, how would you do this after they're gone, right? That was the start of this. And so I chatted with some folks there uh, who work on um, uh, building multimedia systems. Uh, and out of that came some ideas. And out of that came this talk and out of that came this whole line of work. Uh, and so I just wanna go through uh, three of those ideas, plus one more that came from some discussions with Mary Marshall Clark up at Columbia on redaction projection that I'll toss in at the end. 
So the first one I want to talk about is with this group at the University of Southern California. I was at the Information Sciences Institute where people build search engines and translation systems and the sort of stuff I work on. Um, but these folks were sort of across the street and down the way a little bit. Um, and it's the Institute for Creative Technology. And the Army actually had built this with the idea that um, maybe they could use some of this Hollywood technology in, in instruction. And we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so this group got a bunch of you know multimedia designers to uh, to come in uh, and do stuff that other people just couldn't do, um, and uh, and that's where I met David Trom, who had actually been here as a postdoc uh, at Maryland in computer science before he went there, and he's an expert in dialogue and how people talk to each other and how people talk to machines. He did his dissertation on on how to talk to a a train set and tell it, you know, which way to turn, uh, on a, uh, you know, little uh, toy trains. Um, and David Traum built this out of those conversations. I didn't build this. This is David's idea. Um, and what he did was he went and he got uh, a very small number of Holocaust survivors, um, two, three, four, five, handful of Holocaust survivors, and he asked them 2,000 questions. Uh, and these 2,000 questions were, he has been building systems at Gwendy Museums for some time. So they're questions of the sort someone would ask in a museum exhibit. Uh, that, where are you from? Um, what did you think about what happened? Um, did you ever meet? You know, this, you could think of questions, right? So these are questions that someone might ask. And then he built a system that looks like this. When, when we don't know how to build systems as engineers, we just build boxes and arrows. And, and then if we don't know how to build one of the boxes, we just put boxes and arrows inside there. And after a while, we look at this and we're like, I know how to build that box, right? And, and so we just build all the, all the little boxes and then we connect them using the arrows and they never quite do what we think they're going to do, but they kind of come close. Um, and, and so, you know, this is where Google comes from in the first place. And so this is the, this is the thing that he built. So the user pushes the button and talks into the microphone and you get some speech, which you send over to Google, which sends you back a transcript in real time while you're doing it, which then goes up and goes over to a classifier where what they do is they take the answers which they have indexed with all the questions that could reasonably answer. And it matches the question to see if, if it has a good answer to your question. And if not, it plays a, I don't know, could you say that again a different way? But, and, and they recorded Holocaust survivors saying that 200 different ways uh, so that they wouldn't always say the same thing when they couldn't answer. And the other 1800 are substantive answers, which it finds and plays back to you. Um, and so I'll show you a, 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 a TV show. Uh, this is uh, the Today Show um, that got made, um, that gives you a sense for what it is they created out of these sort of very early discussions of what might we be able to do. It's part of a project by the Shoah Foundation and USC's Institute for Creative Technologies to allow us inside the minds and hearts of those history should never forget. Their test subject is 82-year-old Holocaust survivor, Pincus Guter, who lost his entire family in one of Hitler's camps. Pincus and the Holocaust survivors are able to talk to people now. This is the last generation that has that opportunity with him, so we need a way to preserve this interactive experience. For nearly 30 hours, the team asked Pincus over 2,000 questions. When was the last time you saw your sister? Can you tell me about your mother? Do you believe in God? Then they developed a complex algorithm to sort his answers, similar to Siri technology. Computers trying to understand your words and pick out, given the words that it's heard, what's the best response. So David, this is the man that I've flown across the country to meet. Yeah, that's right. Is there anything that I can't ask him? Why don't you ask him that? Is there any question you can't answer? I have no comment about rap music. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> it's amazing. It's almost haunting that he is looking directly yeah. into my eyes. Yeah, this new technology and the person himself uh, will come through as you'll experience. I, was I quickly forget that I'm talking to a recording of Pincus so and I'm drawn into his stories about the family he lost and his twin sister shocked. with the golden those hair. Is there one thing that stays with you 
more than anything else about the Holocaust? I mean, the thing that pains me more than anything else, I can't remember anything about my sister. Before the war, during the war, what she looked like, there's just one thing left. That's the braid. Pincus, do you have any regrets? I regret my family, my surroundings, my life. His ability to answer my questions is incredibly powerful, but it's only half the story. So I got invited to go out to um, uh, USC after they had built this system and, and recorded the Holocaust survivors, because the next thing they were going to record was the Apollo astronauts who landed on the moon. Um, and so and I'm a space geek. Uh, and so I actually got to go and, and make up questions and ask the questions um, and, and collect the recordings and then work with them on testing the system. And it turns out I'm terrible at that because the questions that I ask are all geek questions, right? I mean, they're like, you know, oh, well, when the evaporator didn't work and you went behind the moon on the third moon mission, you know, then I was like, nobody ever asks that question, right? They're all like, you know, what's it like to fly in space? Um, and so it took me a while to sort of understand how this is built, right? You have to get in the minds of the people who are going to use this to try to understand what kinds of questions are going to get asked so that you can answer them. Now, the problem with that system is that it's limited in that if you don't record for that system, it's not going to work. You can't take all this oral history we have and put it into that system because the people aren't answering the questions that people are actually asking. They're answering some question asked by an interviewer and they go on for quite a long time and ask and answering them normally. Whereas here you get these, these snappy answers. And so that's not going to work in the long run. Um, and so I'd like to talk with you now about work of one of my PhD students here at Maryland, uh, who is taking up that challenge and the question is, what could we do if we had a lot of material? Some of the material might be spoken, some of the material might be written, but we might be able to create avatars or something like that. How could we use the material that we have? Um, and so uh, uh, this is uh, Jin's work. Um, and uh, in this work, she's working with materials that are sort of at the sweet spot. If you if you go back too far in time, there's not enough material. So you like to be able to do Albert Einstein or something, but, but collecting all the digital materials is harder the further back you go. If you come too close to the present, I suppose you could do Donald Trump, uh, but you know, it might be, there might be some sensitivities, there might be some content that's not available for various reasons. Jason has talked to us about the FOIA in the past. And so there's sort of a sweet spot where it's old enough that you can get it, uh, and it's uh, not so old that it doesn't exist. And so uh, we picked Ronald Reagan uh, to work on uh, and went and got some of his public papers and personal diary entries. And this is just the sort of scratching the surface of what would you do if you could put words in somebody's mouth, right? How would we take what Ronald Reagan wrote in his diary and use it to answer the questions if you want to speak with Ronald Reagan? Not a spoken Ronald Reagan, everything we have on Ronald Reagan. How would we set up answers for you? And so this is essentially how the system works. You remember what I told you about boxes and arrows, right? When we don't know what we're doing, we do boxes and arrows. Uh, and then eventually the boxes get small enough that we can build them. Um, and so that's the approach here. So imagine there's some conversation going on um, where you first get asked, where were you born? Oh, in Tampico, Illinois, what was it like? And it's like, it, it, what's this it thing? Well, it is Tampico, Illinois. And actually it's, what was it like to live in Tampico, Illinois? That's the question that, what was it like? So you have to take the conversation and collapse it into a question you can answer. And it turns out, there are a group of people working on that problem because they want to be able to talk to your smart speaker. Um, and if, you're, if, if they can process a conversation 
um, that's better than being able to process a single question and answer, which is sort of where the smart speakers are today. So there's a group of people working on that and they've got evaluation frameworks and Jin went and got involved with those folks. But then they weren't working on how do you talk to Ronald Reagan? Um, and so here we get um, this question, what was Tampico, Illinois like? And what we've got is Ronald Reagan answering that question to someone who asked about it. But he spoke to them, not to you. And he spoke at a different time. And he had some common ground with them. So there were certain things he didn't have to say, but he might have to say it to you if you were a museum visitor and you didn't know where Tampico, Illinois was. Uh, I'll bet you you don't know where Tampico, Illinois is. Um, and so um, we can look at Wikipedia and we can find out everything we want to know about Tampico, Illinois. And then we can rewrite this so that it's in the style of Ronald Reagan conversing with you in the present with access to what he said in the past and what we know about those things, right? And so the idea is to put these all in the meat grinder, turn the crank and get somebody talking as they might talk to you now, right? So that's the vision. Um, and so you can see that we've got two things we want to do. We want to put it in the voice of Ronald Reagan, and we want to put it in the voice towards you, right? And so we have to work on technical problems like, well, things that are a correct reference at the original time might be an out of context reference now. Um, things where Ronald Reagan is stating things as personal beliefs, we might want to ground in some way and tell you where that belief comes from. Um, uh, and of course, we have all kinds of phenomenal reference that we need to resolve, things like that. These are all technical problems that we can work on. So this is what Jen's doing for her dissertation. And then we've got this problem of the things we could find out about Tampico. And so that's the second piece of the dissertation. And in order to find out how well it works, we have to actually know what the right answer is. And so we need help from people today who have subject matter knowledge, who can tell us what good answers would be. Um, and so we're working on crowdsourcing uh, to get those good answers. And these things attach all across CAFE. Right? So for example, Victoria is an expert on crowdsourcing uh, and she's working with Jin on the design of crowdsourcing systems uh, that could ultimately develop the kind of ground truth that we need in order to not just test the system, but to train the system because these systems learn from examples. Okay, so the other thing that Jin did, because Jin's a computer scientist, she's that's her background in the fourth hand of high school, but nobody can graduate from an high school without having broader thinking than that. And so she went around and met people who know about the application environment. And um, she did an interview study with four people who have expertise in different kinds of, uh, of topics that are related to what would you do with a system like this if you could, for example, put it into a museum. Um, and in order to do that, she actually built the system. So this is the beauty of being in an iSchool is it's not hard to find places where people know the answers to these questions. And it's not hard to find places where people know how to build these systems. What is hard is to find places that contain both of those. Uh, and so Jin built a system and would sit down with people and take their questions and put them into the system and see what happened. And the system's really slow because it's just an initial prototype system. And while the system was doing its thing, have a conversation and then see the results and then have a conversation about systems like that with an artifact in front of you. Those, those people who study us call that a boundary object, an object that lives in both worlds that both groups can make sense of and can use to ground their conversation. Okay, so 
Um, so this semi-structured interview led Jin, after doing the usual coding process, to, and, and this is a computer scientist doing social science coding, uh, another one of those lovely things about an high school, um, led Jin to, to see three sort of broad themes. One was, we're working on the wrong problem. I mean, we're working on a problem that includes only words. Uh, go try walking through the Holocaust Memorial Museum. It does not include only words. In fact, most of what it conveys, it doesn't convey by words. Um, and so words are important, uh, but if we actually wanna make a difference in a museum, we really ought to start thinking about things the way people in museums think about things. And they think about more than words. Okay, so that was, that was lesson number one, right? Lesson number two is, you know, we might not use this as a museum exhibit. We might use this as a way of actually studying Ronald Reagan. Well, yes, and you might go a step further than that. And you might say, well, we could use this for both. We could use this to draw you into the study of Ronald Reagan, because there are some people who are studying Ronald Reagan but they weren't born studying Ronald Reagan, they somehow got interested in it. And so we can think of a museum as a, uh, as a collection point that gives people exposure to things, some of whom will want to dig deeper and the museum itself has resources that can allow them to do that. So this system could exist in both places. It could exist out in the museum and it could exist in the reading room or the museum's library. Uh, where, where people would actually use it for a different purpose. And of course, out in the museum, you, you want it to be fully integrated with, with multiple modalities um, and, and you'd want it to be talking to you. And, and in here, you'd at least want to have headset on, right? Uh, and so you'll end up building slightly different systems for the two different environments. And so the second thing we learned was we'd ask the wrong question which was also the first thing we learned. The third thing we learned was that we are the, not the source of solutions, which is the way we like to think of ourselves. We're the source of problems. We create new problems. These new systems bring with them new questions and new challenges. Uh, and, and these aren't really new, they're only new to us, but archivists have been thinking about these questions for a long time. Is this record authentic? How would we know this record is authentic? How would we convey to you the record is authentic? Well, okay, we were just trying to actually get the right words spoken and you know, authentic was gonna come a little later for us, uh, but we found out we weren't asking the right question. Well, now that Jin knows that she wasn't asking the right question, She's still going off and answering the original question and somebody else is gonna to have to answer all these other questions, but at least we understand now that answering the questions we're working on isn't the entire story. So this is where we are now and we're in the process of building this system. But doing all of this got me to think about this entire line of work that we have going on now in trustworthy AI. And really this intersects, right? So the, the, there, there are social scientists studying trustworthy AI, but there are AI people studying trustworthy AI. And some AI people at, the, um, at MIT uh, put together a demo just to give you an idea of what could be done. So um, it turned out that back in 1969, when they landed on the moon, um, the, um, uh, uh, one of the uh, speech writers for uh, Richard Nixon wrote a speech for what would happen if they couldn't get off the moon. Because there was only one engine that could get them off the moon. And that engine had never been fired before because if you fired it, you sort of used it up. So they tested engines like it. But the one they were going to use to get off the moon in Apollo 11 had never been used before. Uh, and, and if it didn't work, there was no way off the moon. The Russians, when they did this, sent two engines and either one was enough to get them back into orbit, but they never made it to the moon. The Americans who made it to the moon only brought one engine and perhaps made it to the moon because they only brought one engine, but that made it a little iffy on whether they were gonna get back that day. 
Uh, and so um, they wrote a speech for Richard Nixon, which Richard Nixon never delivered, um, never practiced, just had in case they got a call. There's a red phone in Houston that they could call the president on and say, you know, it's time for the speech, All right? Um, and so anyway, here's the speech, which was never given and never practiced. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fates has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. These two men are laying down their lives in mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. They will be mourned by their families and friends. They will be mourned by their nation. They will be mourned by the people of the world. They will be mourned by a mother earth that dared send two of her sons into the unknown. I'd like to remind you that what we're working on is putting words in people's mouths, right? And we can put anything in their mouths. So I still don't think we've quite covered all the issues that need to be thought of. Um, I like to think of what we do as creating problems for my colleagues to work on. Uh, and we've got a few problems for my colleagues to work on. Um, okay, the third thing, an attempt now to address that concern and stop putting words in people's mouths and still be able to do this, right? So this is now the third try. And this is actually the one we did first. So. This was also work at USC ICT. I did it uh, uh, with them on my sabbatical. They did most of the work. Um, and so I'll describe to you the project. And I think it might give you a bit of a clue of sort of what a somewhat safer first step in this direction might look like. When I was a kid, in 1966, we had a TV program start called the Hollywood Squares. Uh, and in the Hollywood Squares, what would happen is you would get these celebrities, you can see the names of the celebrities uh, behind them, and these people would sit in squares, right? They, they have a little office there and the camera could see in and you know they were stacked on top of each other. It's a tick is set up as tic-tac-toe. Um, and so they would try to give answers and you try to get tic-tac-toe patterns actually out of this. Um, this is Bert Parks, who is the, the moderator. And these are the two important pieces of the puzzle. So they didn't know it at the time, but they invented Zoom, right? I mean, just look at your Zoom display today, right? It looks like the Hollywood Squares. So this idea that we just keep reinventing the same thing, it's true. Uh, so, but the thing I wanna focus on is not the squares, it's Burt Parks. It's the moderator. Without the moderator, you couldn't do what you had. Um, and now Jason Barron says it's Peter Marshall. Okay, I'll even believe it's Peter Marshall. I was like eight in 1966. No, 10. Anyway, um, whoever the moderator is, he the moderator was a key to making the whole thing work. And that's the key that we want to do. We want to build a moderator and let the celebrities talk themselves. Well, now, where are you gonna get the Hollywood Squares content? Um, well, we thought eventually, after we get all the speech recognition stuff working, we'll get it from the Shoah Foundation. But what are we gonna do before that? Uh, well, it turned out that, you remember the army 
were the people paying for USC ICT. Well, they not only paid for USC ICT, they told them what they wanted. And what they wanted was a training system where you could go and watch a, an immersive, you know, think IMAX uh, movie, um, where you would see people who were, you know, ordinary army soldiers who were cast into this situation where they had to make some decisions and then things didn't quite go right. And then afterwards, you could talk to them and ask them, what were you thinking? Why did you do this? Did you consider doing that? Um, and so these people had pre-recorded responses. And what we tried to do was we tried to build a moderator that could introduce a response that better matched your question rather than just bringing up a response like we did with Pincus Gunter, the Holocaust survivor there. Um, and so we got a bunch of army ROTC cadets who in the summer have to go do whatever it is they do in the army. And what they did in the army was they went to Hollywood um, and spent the summer. Um, and while they were there, they were helping with army research. And so they would um, get a question, which is a question actually asked by somebody after watching the video and somebody that knew something about the army. Um, and then they had some answers that were found by the system using the basic approach they used for Pingo's winter. Um, and so then what the ROTC cadet would do is they would click on, I think this is a good answer, and they would write what they think the moderator should say, right? And so we did that on 20 different questions. And then we had someone look at these um, uh, response, these moderated responses and tell us whether the moderator response was a, whether the answer was a good answer. Now look, we didn't change the answer. It's the same answer. All we did was put the moderation before it. And if you look at the red lines, which are after moderation or with moderation, they were bigger than the blue lines. Um, I'm sorry the red lines is without moderation. So lousy is on the left, good is on the right, and we're getting more fives, which are good, and uh, we're getting less ones and twos, which are bad, than with the red system, which was without the moderation. So we were getting, and you can see here, the definitions of one through six. Um, and so um, we were generally doing better by putting moderation in. We wrote a paper for the Army Science Conference on this. And in that paper, we analyzed what it was that got put into the moderation because we want to build an automated moderator one day. We want to know what it is we want a, the moderator to do. Well, the moderator can introduce the speaker. The moderator can explain why this thing they're about to say is an answer to your question, even though they didn't use your words. The moderator can reformulate the question the moderator can point out one part of the answer that was the answer to your question, or you can't really do this in museums, but you can do it in the army. The moderator could say, that's a stupid question. You should have asked this, because remember, it's a training video. Uh, anyway, so I'm not sure that we're going to have this guide the discussion quite in the same way as they had in the army, but nonetheless, these were the kinds of links we saw. So, you can imagine that we could build technology to automatically generate moderators. And maybe when Jin gets done making Ronald Reagan, she'll start making Ronald Reagan moderators. Okay, last thing, uh, just to take a minute here before we finish up, you remember that corrected uh, uh, oral history transcript that I showed? So here it is again, same one. Um, one of the problems that we have is that people say things they wish they hadn't said, or people don't say things they wish they had said, but they sort of self-censor. And so back in the days where we were going to let people edit the transcript, they might speak more freely. And then we, they could edit out things that they didn't want in the final transcript. And we have lots of examples of this where people have actually done this, particularly in Colombia, where they were doing diplomatic history, but in all the oral history collections, it did it this way. 
And we lost this when we went to the Shoah Foundation view that, that the tape is the thing, right? It's the, 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 the voice, it's oral history, because there's no way to edit that. Except you can make a transcript of it using speech recognition. And then you can edit the transcript. And then you can edit the speech based on the edited transcript. And now we have finally solved the problem of not putting words in people's mouths. They decided carefully what they want to say to posterity. And we make sure that what they actually say is what they wanted to say. Well, it turns out back in 1998, somebody wrote a paper for some, you know, ICSLP as a, some big speech conference in which they were trying to align transcripts with audio where there might be deletions from the transcript and they wanted to know how they should apply those deletions to the audio. It's a solved problem, right? All we have to do is be able to make transcripts, which we're getting better at. Okay. Alrighty, so what's the point? Well, we got a lot of audio and we got 10 blue links. Now we got that today. And if it's good enough, you just wasted an hour. If it's not, well, then we got a lot of directions we can go and we're sort of poking around trying to understand what the strengths and weaknesses of these different directions are. We're experimenting, right? Trying to figure out what's the right question. And when we do, we find out that you can't answer these questions with technical methods. They're not technical questions. These are questions about how we interact with our own heritage which also can't answer them without technical methods. These are technical questions. How do we do the thing we want to do? And so if we're going to get this discussion going between the technologists and the people who are going to think about what to do with the technology, we need a place to do that. We call that place cafe. We work on everything from soup to nuts. And you can decide whether this was soup or not. Thank you, Doug. We already have some entertaining comments in the chat. Feel free to add questions. Um, and I, if if no one minds, I'll start with a question, um, which is, um, this got me thinking a lot about, uh, as well about um, institutional siloing and sort of the ways that uh, belongings or object collections usually go to museums and archival materials usually go to archives. Not always the case, you know, there's sometimes things go elsewhere. And then of course things go to many different places. And so, I was curious about, um, yeah, A, whether there's some way to think about, like, is there some equivalent for thinking about material culture or belongings that are in museums? I don't know what that would look like exactly. Um, and, and how do you deal with the problem of the sort of like distributed nature of the kinds of things that might be interesting um, to say, a, you know, an exhibition or to a system that, that is trying to represent collections of some kind? Well, one thing that we have going for us is that if it's not digital, we can't do anything with it. And so I get to assume that somebody has made this thing digital, even if they didn't make it digital with my use in mind, right? Uh, now, it turns out that's happening naturally but it might need to be guided, right? Somebody might need to say, oh, you know, if you digitize this, they would use it over there. And it's like, they were thinking they might digitize it for this reason, but there's this other reason that they didn't know about. Um, and so, you know, maybe there's something that's between your world and mine that we could do there. Um, 
but but otherwise I've just assumed that you know somehow this thing becomes digitized and, and then I have the problem. Well, gosh, once it's digitized, um, if you have things that need to find each other, well, then you want to work with somebody who works on search, right? Um, because now you got a, a find it problem where you know I don't know you hold up a vase and or vase you say vase or vase anyway uh, you you hold up a vase uh, and and you wanna you wanna find you know the the oral history of the person who made the vase um, okay it's a search problem um, I work on information retrieval we can work on that search problem uh, now you say oh the world's very sparse not everything's connected I'm like patience right? Um, 50 years from now, all this stuff that we've been doing will be more widely adopted if it's useful and not if it's not. Um, so I'm willing to believe there's work to be done there on finding it so that we can do what in archives gets called virtual reunification. I'm happy once it's virtually reunified. I don't have to physically reunify it to make me happy. Uh, I can do my thing once it's when, when, once I even know of their existence, right? I don't care where they are. We copy everything. Uh, which is another ethical problem we might have to work through. Is that helpful at all? Yes, I think, yeah. Um, anyway, we should talk more about this. I think that's, it would be really interesting. Um, so let's go Travis next. I think Travis had their hand up first. Yeah, Doug, this is um, phenomenal. Thank you so much. And I, I really love the sort of talk around a moderator sort of maybe alleviating some of these larger social questions, but as you might imagine, still have an additional social question in, in that sort of frame. And it was that sort of point you were raising about making people say things they did not say. And I think that's really interesting. And just using Reagan as like the case example here, right? Um, so I'm just imagining a, a museum goer or, or a, a student being like, well, uh, President Reagan, tell me about the AIDS epidemic. You know, what were your opinions about that, right? Him and his administration notoriously silent about that, right? Um, so what, would that be a question of moderation or would it be like content warnings and sort of what models are you, you thinking might inform that, right? Okay, so a couple of things. One is, um, it may well be that Reagan wasn't silent on it in every uh, venue. Reagan might have written in his diary about this. Um, uh, Reagan might have have had a personal letter with somebody that that uh, so so it may be that Reagan is silent in public, and then over time it will turn out that Reagan wasn't actually completely silent on this. Now we may or may not like what Reagan said about it, uh, but but we might be able to to find things and bring them into a different form of, of interaction. The second thing is Reagan's not the only game in town. Uh, and so when we were originally designing this, we were sort of sketching out an NSF proposal. Uh, and in the NSF proposal, Reagan and Gorbachev are talking and this kid walks up in the museum and, and there are Reagan and Gorbachev and you can ask them both questions, right? Uh, that turned out to be twice as hard as just being able to ask Reagan questions. And for Gorbachev, we had to do it like in Georgia. Uh, or in Russian or something. So, I mean, it was, you know, uh, so anyway, that sort of faded away. But this idea that you could put people in conversation uh, and, and, and you don't have to have only two people and the moderator, uh, that would give you the ability to, um, to, to do something uh, that you couldn't uh, do directly from the character. And the third thing is we have given this a little bit of thought uh, and our present best thinking is to have a Kevin Spacey uh, turn directly to the camera uh, and uh, and tell you what he's thinking um, uh, in sort of House of Cards style, um, and uh, and that may not be the best idea either. Uh, Victoria, thank you, Doug. Yeah, this is fascinating. Great to hear about your work in more detail. Um, so there were a lot of things coming up for me, and like Diana, I definitely want to have a further conversation offline at some point, but um, I think the two that are fizzing the most for me right now is thinking about this intersecting more generically, I guess is what I'm trying to say with search functionality in um, discovery systems, cultural heritage discovery systems. Um, do you think that there is scope? And I think maybe 
considering what you were just saying about the difficulty of bringing two voices into conversation, I think I already know the answer, but in any case, um, having all of the various voices that are in a retrievable format and an archive, you know, for whom there is a text transcription essentially, be able to answer a search question. Um, is that something that could be on the cards? Um, do you think that the AI could ever get good enough so that it could return results from much uh, smaller corpora, lesser known figures whose, whose speech is findable in an archival setting? Yeah, so if you think about the third one I talked about, that's what it's about, right? I mean, we only have this one recording of this Holocaust survivor. That's the only thing we have for that one person. But we have 55,000 mm. of them. Um, and so, um, you know, in information retrieval, we talk about recall and precision, right? And recall is how many of the things that we, that we would have liked to have found were we able to find. And precision is how much of what we found uh, is trash. Um, and we need good precision here. I mean, if we can't answer your question, you know, if it's nine questions out of 10, we give you a babble. Uh, you're not going to use the system. So we have to have good precision, but we don't have to have good recall. I mean, there are seven something billion people on this planet uh, and, and four billion of them have cell phones in their pocket. And I mean, you know, we are not short on data. Um, so if, if you ask a question and your question is, what does Mildred think about this? Then I've got to get you Mildred's thoughts. But if you ask a question, tell me about this. The fact that I got 7 billion people makes the problem easy. Um, and th this is, in fact, how the web works, right? I mean, if you go to a library catalog and you type in your query, uh, what's the chance you type your words in exactly the way they're indexed in the library catalog? Well, I mean, you know, maybe, uh, particularly if you're an expert. Uh, but but you go to the web and you type in your words, what's the chance somebody else typed in words like that? Well, there's just so much stuff on the web that that the search problem is easier when there's a more diverse collection to be searched. Um, so we benefit in search if you don't hold me to high recall, hold me to high precision, allow me low recall. And if you set up a problem like that, I can answer the question. So, okay, yeah, interesting. So, and I guess I'm aware of like the very different behavior of most content management systems and cultural heritage versus the average browser um, search architecture. Any thoughts on that? Um, I think recall and precision are kind of functioning very differently in those environments. Well, as I say, if you need to find what a specific person said about something, and we don't have very much of what they said, uh, and they only mentioned this once, um, we have every chance of missing it. Uh, but that's not the problem I'm trying to solve here. The problem I'm trying to solve is how do I talk to the past, right? And, and there's some other problem of, of how do I search the past to find exactly what you wanted to find. And so I, I wanna come back and pitch my problem again because, because I think we've, we've missed part of the implications of this kind of work. Um, until about, oh, I don't know, 3,000 years ago, um, all we had was the spoken word. And we didn't have the ability to search it. We didn't have the ability to find it again. We just had the spoken word. We had the ability to remember it, right? Um, <clears throat> so we had the spoken word and we had human memory. And then finally, we got writing. Our entire civilization has been based on writing. I mean, the, everything we do is, is fundamentally traceable back to that invention of writing. That's because we could find it again when we need it. Um, it's got permanence, but speech has permanence now too. Only in our lifetimes, but speech now has permanence and we can find it. So I think think we're at the cusp of being able to think, what would it be like if speech had the things that writing had, but it was speech, right? For which we are optimized. 
And so, so the thing I'm thinking about here isn't so much how do I how do I fix the problem of search in an archival context, or how do I fix the problem of search in a museum? How do I change the way we think about interaction so that this kind of interaction, I mean, the reason I have a paper on this, you could have read it. This is different, right? The fact that we're having a conversation about it, we are co-constructing something. Um, I claim that the fact that we have given permanence and findability um, to speech now shifts what our society can do. It doesn't shift it back entirely to speech. It will be speech and text together now going forward. Um, but it's incumbent on us to think about that. And there is so much more speech in the world than there is text. I mean, this group of people on this call um, write more than almost everybody on the planet on an average day, right? How many words you write today? How many words you speak today? And you write more than everybody else. Almost everything ever produced as words by humans has been produced in speech. And that will probably be true for the next century. And we can now do things with that we couldn't do before. Anyway, that's what gets me excited about it, but that's just a long way of not answering your question. Um, thank you for that. And I'm suitably admonished uh, for not reading your paper, so you can send me the title of that at your leisure. Um, I am taking over moderation for now uh, because Diana had to step off, but um, Caitlin, over to you for your question. And we are at um, a little after five, so if anybody has to hop off, of course, please do, but we're going to keep recording and this will be available on uh, the website. Cool. So I guess more more of some comments than questions, Doug. There's definitely questions worked in there. Uh, I was really interested and I put this comment in uh, the chat. If you've read any of Tonya Sutherland's work on the digital afterlife stuff, um, I was thinking that particularly because when I saw her give a talk about this a few years ago, one of her big examples of kind of digital afterlife issues was talking about the hologram of Tupac Shakur giving performances and being sort of like, oh, this is potentially very troubling because you're sort of resurrecting a dead person without their permission, right? And I think in a lot of the examples that you were using, like particularly with the Holocaust survivor, that is with their permission. They recorded a lot of material, so it is kind of a different ethical bent. Um, but I would love to dig into that sort of stuff more. I feel like, you know, that's that's my bread and butter. So I would love to write about the work that y'all are doing from this ethical perspective. But I was also wondering if you've spoken to other Holocaust museums outside of Shoah Foundation about how they might use this kind of stuff. So I'm thinking of, of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in particular and how like that permanent exhibition closes right now with videos of people telling like personal testimony stories. And that's like a super conscious choice to be like, we love to end with stories. And I feel like this type of project would fit in perfectly with the types of things that they do. So I wonder if you've had conversations there yet. Um, so no, we have talked to a number of other um, scholars of the Holocaust back when we were working on uh, with the Shaw Foundation, which was just a seven year period, right? This is not about the Holocaust. Uh, this is a, a Toy Story, right? Uh, this is about things we can build. And then it becomes an information access story. And the Holocaust is an application that will help us to think. Uh, but it's not the focus. It's not the problem we're, we're trying to address. Um, there's a tremendous literature out there uh, in which people are trying to grapple with what these issues are. I gave this talk to a technical audience. And the question I got was, you've seen the Black Mirror episode, right? Um, and well, no. And now I've only seen one Black Mirror episode in my entire life, but it was really well done. But that was a case where they brought a physical body back, right? Okay, so people are thinking that. I got started on this, um, uh, this Ronald Reagan thing from something called Tombstone Chat. And Jin will not let me call it Tombstone Chat. 
Uh, but but this was from from someone whose friend had died, uh, and they knew how to make a GPT model that could generate uh, text in a style, and they simply trained it on their friend's style. And then you know, this was you know in sort of blog world, uh, and 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 got a really good conversation going about how ethical that is to do, um, and so. Um, there's all kinds of issues on this. Uh, I'll tell you an, another one that you never would have thought of. Uh, a friend of mine at Microsoft, very senior researcher at Microsoft Research, um, uh, the Salton Award winner in the you know, SIG IR world, so the top award in information retrieval, built a system one day that, that would take your search and it had a little slider bar on the bottom. And it would say, don't use my hard drive, or use everything on my hard drive. And, and she just ran some experiments with the slider bar in different positions to see if the search got better. And it does. Just show me everything on your hard drive. That's you. So now we can have a lot of fun with, oh, what else can we do with everything on your hard drive? So, I mean, yeah. I was thinking Tombstone Chat was gonna be like email. Uh, and you know, people would email me back uh, that even if they weren't here anymore. Uh, but but this is way scarier than that. People will write the paper that Victoria wants to read. Well, thanks, Doug. Sure, and I will follow up on your uh, reference. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jason. Over to you. Hey, Doug, I think this is uh, really important work and um, seeing the Holocaust uh, uh, exhibit and the person involved, uh, you know, it's kind of mind blowing. But, um, but here's the thing, um, you are aware that um, the recent uh, developments in AI um, uh, include uh, speakers who ask um, a particular software uh, to um, uh, uh, ask a question and and the software writes a story based on knowing everything on the web that they've learned um, and that these are increasingly realistic stories my uh, concern or my interest here is, is sort of a turing test where the the ground truth of all of these oral uh interviews and whatever um the real products that you have you put together and you develop a model and then an individual is speaking uh, a set of stories based on what is grounded in reality. But if you put them in one room and you compare um, a software agent who is simply going to the web to create stories um, about anything, could be about Ronald Reagan's visit to Bitburg and the controversy over being at a military ceremony. And so you have the combined materials on the one hand from the Reagan Library over in room A, and you have the web on room B. And the question is, which story is more convincing or are they both, um, you know, are, are, can one be tricked? So as to which is the, the real story from the Reagan Library. Have you thought about those kind of questions or concerns? Um, so I'll give you two answers. One is the problem that you raised exists in nature as well. You don't need a machine to do that, right? I think we call that Breitbart. Um, so, I mean, I can, I can generate any kind of story I want using a human as the story generator. And we have to teach people, this is another great thing about iSchools, how to drill down. And so maybe I'm gonna to have to put in my system something that says, you know, you click here to, you know, to see the documents on which this is based and you're gonna to have to make decisions on that. So that's the first answer. The second answer is you have way too much faith in technology. Uh, in fact, everybody who says artificial intelligence has too much faith in technology. Uh, there is no artificial intelligence. We are making minor birds. Uh, these things just repeat things they've heard before. Um, and, and, and they can learn more and more complicated patterns and they can learn really complicated patterns, but they lisp. Uh, I mean, they, they, they make mistakes, they're, they're detectable. Um, I mean, the, the present systems will go along and then they'll say yabba dabba 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 dabba. 
Uh, and it's like, people don't do that. Uh, well, most people don't do that. Uh, so, so you can tell this thing came out of a machine. Google has this problem. They, they learn how to do translation by crawling the web and finding all the translations that have ever been made, right? And then they just learn the patterns in those translations and that's how they train translation systems. And you know what their problem is? Most of the translations that have ever been made were made by Google's translator. So the first thing they do on all the translations they do is they run them through a classifier to find out if they're a Google translation. And if they are a Google translation, they exclude it from their new training and otherwise they use it in their new training. So, so even the people who are building this, pardon my expression, AI, um, know that they can't train on their own AI systems output. They have to be able to detect when their own AI system is doing the wrong thing. Um, and, and, and they can, it's easy because they, they make mistakes in a certain pattern, right? So that doesn't say that 20 years from now, there won't really be AI, but right now they're just a bunch of machines out memorizing things. And they're just memorizing more and more and more complex things. And they're looking at more and more and more data, but they still make mistakes and they're detectable mistakes. And if you watch the, just, just, I mean, the video I showed is on the web, right? From MIT, just go watch the video again. I mean, when you know it's a fake, it is really easy to see. I mean, 20 different things are wrong in that video. And that is the best we can make. Thanks. Uh, Okay. Great. Well, um, I just want to share one slightly lighthearted thing. Thinking about your moderator um, reminded me of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, where the civil servants to the British Minister of Government and then Prime Minister often have to interpret what the minister is saying for various different audiences. And they'll say, I think. I think what the minister is trying to say is, and I can see your moderator, um, you know, batting away the awkward questions or the things it knows the system can't answer, and you know, say, I think I think what the question asker is trying to say is indeed, and the moderator could actually put words in the mouth of the speaker by by interpreting it out of context, right? So we haven't completely gotten rid of the problems. We've just we just reduce them to a lower level. Uh, I'll have to look up Yes Minister. I'm learning all sorts of culture from this, uh, but, but I've come across this idea before. And when I came across it, it was called what the professor meant to say. Yes, it's, it's usually like, let me just gloss over that awkward moment or, yeah. you know, it's, it's the, the helper trying we'll to contain. We'll cover that next week, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you again, Doug, for your great talk. Thanks all who are able to attend today. Um, it will be going out on the website in due course, probably in a couple of weeks. And uh, just remains to say clap, clap, clap again. And we'll be back in the fall, first Wednesdays. Bye, folks. <laughs>